Hi, everybody. My name is Ken Kent. I'm the founder of Sign World 32 years ago. Uh, today, uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, we have four Sign World owners uh, here on camera. Uh, we're going to let each one of them introduce themselves. Uh, and then uh, we're going to move right into questions. So Jacqueline Perkins, you'll be up first, followed by Andrew and Gordon Peary, uh, and on down the list. So when it is your turn, uh, come off a of mute. Uh, ask us your uh, most burning hardball question. And each one of the owners will answer your question one by one. You'll we'll get four answers to every question you ask. We go in a round robin fashion. So you ask a question, move on to the next person. And then uh, uh, after that, you can type uh, questions into the chat box uh, and we'll handle them in the order that they come in. But we'll have plenty of time to answer all of your questions in the next hour. Uh, before um, uh, I, uh, Jack, you want me to introduce everyone first and then you'll yeah, go ahead and let each of them get their introductions. Uh, so first off, Helen McKinstry, Helen, give us a wave. Tell everybody about uh, your sign company. My name is Helen McKinstry. Uh, I own Sabre Sign Solutions. We are located in the Austin, Texas area. Great place to live. Uh, we have been open three years this coming June, so just about three years coming up on our third anniversary. We're currently in 1,800 square feet, uh, actively looking into moving into a bigger space this coming spring. I currently have four employees working for me. Um, this year, our projection uh, for revenue is probably around about $450,000. And um, I would say if I look at the projects that I've done so far, Amongst my biggest projects, one of my biggest clients was actually a construction company that was building their own uh, uh, new headquarters building. So this was going to be their showcase because they are a construction company. Uh, and so we did their interior and their exterior signage for that building uh, for around $40,000, $45,000. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Larry Foster, give us a wave, Larry. Tell us all about your business. You're on mute, Larry. We're not hearing you again. <clears throat> Ken, why don't you give Larry a minute, uh, go to Eric and we'll come back to Larry in just a minute. I think he's just connected. Are you there, Larry? No, yeah. still on mute. Eric Gustafson, give us a wave, Eric. Okay, tell us where you are and tell us about your business. All right, uh, hi, I'm Eric Gustafson, owner of Impression Signs and Graphics. We are in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul market, technically Oakdale, Minnesota. Uh, we have been in business seven years and we are in 5,000 square feet, which is an expansion of our original space that started at 2,500 square feet. Um, as far as employees, we're pretty lean. Myself, two full-time people, a part-time person, and then I work with numerous subcontractors. Uh, most of our installation work is that we, we choose to use subcontractors. So um, our sales production for 2020 was 850,000, which was just very slight growth from our 830 we did last year. I do plan to adjust that downward due to COVID, but I haven't, haven't taken the time to figure that out yet. And our biggest customer project to date, uh, last summer and fall, we did $148,000 project, which was a bunch of different signage at a, at a shopping mall um, that was doing a bunch of renovation and expansion. And over 100,000 of that was handicapped uh, parking signage, so. Um, wasn't real, well, yeah, wasn't real glamorous, but it was good, good money. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we lost Larry. So Jack, do you want to, uh, introduce yourself? 
Hi, I'm Jack Werner. I was a sign world owner myself for 10 years, starting in 1,200 square feet, ending up in 5,000 square feet. Uh, staff of 11 doing 1.3 million in sales uh, before the days of the internet. So their, our business model back then was quite different than it is today. We were totally involved. I then sold my business, went into a partnership with Ken to learn his end of the business uh, for about a seven year period, finished buying him out five years ago, have taken over as president owner of Sign Room. Ken has stayed on with many numerous roles, but we've relieved him of a lot of the day-to-day -day things and we still appreciate having him here. Um, today, when I answer questions, if it goes to my experience running a sign world operation, I'll answer from that perspective. But the question leads more to training and, and support and things like that. I'll answer from that corporate ex experience. Um, Ken, as a note, we have uh, 31 participants. Uh, so there's two screens of names. You need to use the arrow to go left to right. Uh, for our panel of owners, uh, knowing we have 30 some people on the call, please try and keep your answers brief and short so we can get through everybody the best we can. Anybody that we miss, I'm not getting your audio. Please, if we skip over you to go to the next one, just type in your question. We'll make sure by the end that we've gotten everybody's questions. Two quick comments that I'd like to make to everybody here, whether you're an individual looking at SignWorld to start a business or you're a business coach trying to understand SignWorld better. SignWorld was set up as a non-franchise. We're an owner's alliance. Uh, there's really six differences between us, but the two biggest ones is there's no rules. You have complete autonomy to change anything you want. We're there to support you, but we're not there to control you. Uh, and second is there's no royalties to pay, one-time payment, lifetime support. We believe more help and support in our system than there is in most franchises. We're not here to beat up franchises and say we're good and they're bad, but a franchise is more appropriate. If it's a cookie cutter approach to multiple customers, this is custom production. A franchise is appropriate for mass advertising, but we're going after handfuls of customers and repetitive customers. Franchise is appropriate if it's an industry that's dominated by big names, but this is a totally fragmented industry. So setting Signworld up with no rules, no royalties, gives the owners more flexibility and we believe more advantages. The second thing, don't confuse us with printers. Printers do the handheld items, brochures, catalogs, and business cards. That's a stagnant industry. We're putting graphics on everything from a staircase to an elevator to grain silo to machinery parts to rockets and on and on. An industry that's growing and the internet's our best friend. Ken, uh, Larry's back. Uh, one thing we didn't get from Helen and from Eric uh, was their background beforehand. Helen, what was your background before? So I was with IBM for 32 years. So I was a corporate, uh, in corporate America. I was uh, uh, an executive uh, software engineer most of my career in upper management and then in business consulting the last part of my career. Okay. Larry Foster, can you hear me? Oh, no. He's still struggling. He's still on mute. Sure, here, Dan, if you could call Larry on the side and, and see if you can walk him through and get him get him back in here, that'd be great. Or we're sending you to Detroit, Sure, on the next <laughs> one. Eric, what was your background before this? Yeah, so I'm originally a CPA, um, which led into consulting and many years in finance, operations, leadership, and corporate America. So this whole investment passed your CPA test. Say that again, Ken. Your whole investment in sign world passed your CPA test standards. Yeah, yep, it okay. did. All right. And Ken, if I can, I'll give a quick introduction to Larry. I think I know him well enough. Larry's been with us since 2001, started at 1,700 square feet. He now owns an 8,000 square foot building. I believe he's got a staff of 11. Uh, last year did about 1.7 million in sales and uh, came out of corporate America. He was a VP of operations for Kmart beforehand. Uh, I believe his largest customer is a chain of, of dental clinics uh, that he takes care of in a multi-state uh, area. And his second largest customer is a uh, junkyard. It's called Pick and Pull. They have 65 locations. That's where you go to the junkyard, you pull the bumper off the car, take it to the office, weigh it in, and pay by the pound. Uh, Larry gets orders for Pick and Pull junkyard signs every day of the week. Every day of the week, one of those 65 locations is ordering some kind of signage. 
Um, okay, well, should we start out with Jacqueline Perkins? Jacqueline, do you want to come off a of mute? Go ahead, okay, Jacqueline. Hello. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, Go ahead with see. your question. Okay, so I am Jackie Perkins, and I was invited on this call uh, by my daughter, Stacy, and she's not able to get through. But to be honest with you, she just asked me to be on the call for listening ears. But can you spell the name of the company that you said? I know it's Simo or what What was the name? Sign World, S-I-G-N-W-O-R-L-D. And if, oh, you Sign want to, if you want to look up our website, it's signworld.org. Okay. okay. And that's it for me. My daughter is actually trying to uh, look at some... Okay. Uh, franchises and things like that. So, okay. thank you. You can go thank back you. on mute, Jacqueline. Andrew, okay, Zacharias, Andrew, come off a of mute. There you go, Andrew. Go ahead. If uh, the folks and I did talk to Larry last Friday, so I appreciated his input. And he, he was great. Um, but if the others could go through the most successful skill set of your first one or two employees as advice to a a new owner. Helen, your advice as far as the skill set that you're looking for for that first one or two employees. Okay, so for the first employee, you definitely want somebody who is an experienced sign maker. So you are looking for skills, for very specific skills to help you get started. Beyond that, you're going to be looking much more heavily at adaptability, uh, willingness, and um, ability to learn and grow. Uh, and a positive attitude. So you're gonna be looking for those softer skills much more than the harder skills after that first hire. Now you still want your first hire to have those skills, but the first hire is also critical to get some of those hard skills to support you as you're opening. Eric Gutterson, your thoughts. Yeah, I'd uh, second what, what Helen said. Um, just making sure they, it, they actually know how to run equipment, know how to work with their hands. Um, and at least can do very basic things in the Adobe suite. Um, it, it, as long as they have those three things, you can at least get off the ground um, and then be more selective as you move beyond your first hire um, in terms of personality. I didn't have a great personality in my first hire, but he was a perfect first hire to get us off the ground. <clears throat> Larry Foster, can you hear me? I can hear you. Am I? It. We got you. We got you. Do not. Keep yeah, your hands, keep your I hands, knew I could do it. Keep your hands above the table. Okay, so Larry, <laughs> the question is, tell us the skills of the first and the second hire. Is it true, Larry? How many years have you been in business now? Uh, 19 years. Cool. Go ahead and introduce yourself. You didn't get the chance yet. Okay, well, I've been in business for 19 years. The name of my company is Signs and More. Um, I'm in my third location. I started off in 1,700 square feet, moved to a 4,000 square foot building, and I purchased about 10 years ago an 8,000 square foot building. Um, we have 11 employees, and we do about 1.7 million in, in sales. And Larry, what did you used to do? Um, I used to be, when I left, I was the uh, vice president of operations for Kmart. Okay. And Larry, is it true, 19 years in business and you still have your very first employee? Uh, that's very true, yes. Tell us about the skills that you're looking for in your first and your second employee. Well, the first employee, it, it need to be mostly a sign maker. Uh, they need to know how to make signs, how to do basic, uh, simple installations. And it's great if they know uh, a little bit about design work, very limited, taking somebody's logo and putting some words with it. Um, but as important as that, it's got to be someone that you get along with. They have a nice personality because you're out doing networking things, going out seeing customers, and they're in the building. They are representing your company. So the, their personality side is important. And then beyond that, then you start adding and getting a little more specific. Maybe you bring in somebody with a design background and you let that original person do all the sign making. Uh, and then you start hiring for just attitude. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Jack, your thoughts. We'll give you the ads to place. We'll tell you where to place the ads. That first person is a journeyman with 5, 10, 15 years experience. This is their career. 
They can design the sign, they can print the sign, they can assemble the sign, they can install the sign. First one needs to have the talents, and then from there it's hiring from attitude. We Sign World, we will help you find that person. We will interview them. We will test them. We'll send them down the street to another Sign World owner to evaluate them for you. And then once you hire them, they can go to all of our training programs, no extra charge. Randy, come off of mute. Randy. Good morning or good afternoon for you guys. Uh, my name is Randy George. I'm calling from Honolulu. Um, I was invited on here uh, by Dan Warner um, because right now, currently we live out here, but we're trying to make the transition to Florida to be closer to family. And Everything I've looked at online about Sign World, I really like. Um, I guess I kind of got the answer, the question answered about, in, in like in layman's terms, for somebody who's not been in the Sign World business. Yes, I bought signs before, plenty of them, um, but not knowing anything about uh, making signs, the design. How difficult is it to get in this business? Um, Helen, not knowing anything about signs, tell us what it was like getting into it. Well, I didn't know anything about signs. Um, but again, I hired an experienced sign maker, somebody who knew some design skills, Adobe Illustrator, somebody who'd assembled, could install. Um, and, you know, you've got quite a lot of uh, training uh, material available to you through Sign World's training, um, you know, through, through webinars that are offered through Sign World. Uh, and there's an amazing owner network. So if you come across a sign, and you don't have a clue about all you do, all I did was post something out on the Sign World forum or pick up the phone and call another Sign World owner and say, what is this and what do I do with it? And so that kind of support structure behind you is really what you need to get going. Okay. You don't really need to understand signs coming in. Eric Gustafson, what was it like for you? Um, yeah, I, I, I had zero experience in signs. I didn't know anything about signs. Um, but I, you know, if you have a general sense or business acumen and a little bit of versatility and skill in terms of being able to manage people, talk to people, know enough about numbers that you don't get overwhelmed by them. I mean, any, I don't want to say anyone can do this, but um, anyone that's fairly well-rounded can figure it out. It's, it, I mean, signs are not that complicated once you, once you dive into it. I thought they were, but, you know, seven years later, it's like, well, it's just it's just a series of problem solving. So, and that's what we do for our clients every day. And it's not rocket science. Larry Foster, your thoughts? Oh no, Larry, you went on mute again. Larry, I you're did. on mute again. Here, there. I think I'm. Am I back on? Yes. Okay. When I started, uh, I didn't know anything about signs, and when by the time you get done with all of your training you certainly know a lot more than your customer is going to know. So it really comes down to having the business background and then gathering information at the customer, bringing it back, and you have that experienced sign person that helps you with the, the actual signage part of the business. Jack Warner? Randy, in 32 years, we've brought in hundreds of sign world owners that not only still are part of the system, but have run a business successfully retired out. Out of all those hundreds, one had sign experience. We were more apprehensive about him because we had to retrain him. We're really looking for your project management skill, your relationship building skill. You're going to hire the staff and we're going to teach you enough about science. You can be fully capable of running a very successful sign company. Okay. Gordon Peary. Gordon, am I saying it right? Come off of mute. Hello. Go ahead. Well, yes, thank you, Ken. Go ahead. Thank you. Folks, um, everybody seems to be from a sort of different background in business before and Eric started to go towards my question, which is, as you started out, what do you think the most important attribute you brought to the table for yourself and growing the business was or is that you need? Helen, what was the most important attribute you brought to the table? I think it's knowing the difference between being on the business and being in the business and being willing to think strategically about how I wanted to grow my business, what types of skills I'd want to have to get to my goals of being a self-sustainable business after a period of time. 
So, so you know, again, really, I think the skill is business skills more than anything, managing people, developing relationships with customers as well as vendors, subcontractors, and others. Um, and again, being on the business and being willing to think about what do I need to do to help grow that business over time. Eric Gustafson, what did you bring to the business? What skills? Uh, I mean, just general business skills. Um, it's just kind of who I am. But um, what I was going to say that, that I think I bring that differentiates and, and is critical to our success is a passion for um, exceeding expectations for customers. So that's what keeps me up at night is how are we, it, the fear of failing customers. And because of that, we go the extra mile to satisfy customers, to get it right for them and come up with great solutions. And I think that's a, been a key to our company's success is that mindset. Thank you, thank you. Larry Foster, what attributes did you bring to the table when you started your sign company? Well, I, I think it's the, the business background. Your customers are business people. And when you walk in and, and you have a solid business background, I think that comes across. And I think a lot of the other competitors just don't have that kind of a background. And I think it, it makes you stand out. Jack? As Larry said, most of our competition are former sign makers trying to run a business. We're trying to take business people and teach them how to run a sign manufacturing company. We're putting a professional approach an industry that's been around for a thousand years. Okay. Uh, George, without a last name, George, come off the mute. Tell us your last name, George. I'm George Matz, Amazon Mary, ATZ, St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, we've been talking to Jack for the last several weeks, probably about four weeks now. And, and one thing that I've, my main concern has always been, this is really a, the way I see it. It's a uh, consultative sale. And not knowing anything going in at the beginning, it's pretty hard to be a, a consultant. I heard some of the answers today that make a whole lot of sense, but how can you ease my mind about that? I mean, I buy signs. We, we, we have a salon. We're part owners of a, of a salon. And we do window signs and stuff like that. But I'll be honest with you. We do, we do what we are consulted to do. Uh, we're, we don't have any ideas. I mean, our sign maker, we rely very, very heavily on from a creative standpoint, not hanging the sign or anything like that, but from a creative standpoint. What, a, what, what can you tell me that would ease my, my concern, that major concern? Helen McKinstry? So I think, you know, I, I completely understand that concern, but I think you'll be surprised at A, how quickly you will start learning. Um, B, you use some of those consultative skills that you already have that, that engage the customer in asking lots of questions so that you're starting to, independent of your understanding of signs, you're starting to understand, you know, what, are, what is he going for? Is he going for branding? Is he going for visibility? Is he going for low-end budget, pure, you know, base functionality versus high-end? Um, so use those consultative skills you already have to, to engage with the client asking questions then take what you learn from that conversation and reach out to some other sign world owners. Go back and forth with them. Talk to your designer or your sign maker on staff. So you'll quickly develop those skills. In the beginning, you've already got some of those skills that help you with that initial conversation. And then you've got a great structure around you to help you with the rest. Eric Gustafson, your thoughts. Um, yeah, but I, ever since he said St. Petersburg, Florida, I can't get my mind off of one of my favorite meals at this place called the Central Avenue Oyster Bar in St. Pete. They have this crawfish pasta. It's like, I, it's, I, I want to go there for that. I hope that place makes it through COVID. Anyway, I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, George, go ahead. Say it again. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying that this is the way I see it is a very uh, consultative sale and not knowing anything. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of good things here today, but not knowing anything ab ab about sign, how, how your first six months, how does that work where people are looking to you for creative ideas and you don't have any? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends. I mean, I, I grew my business through interacting with a, a personal network of people that all knew I was new in the business. And, you know, and, and I was just honest with them. Some of them would say, well, you're the expert. And I, I 
it, I'd actually tell people, well, you know, no, I'm not, but I surround myself with experts. So I'm going to help solve your problem. So help me understand what you think you need to accomplish. And I'm going to get together with the right people to come to you with a solution. So that's, that's my mindset. We, we solve problems. We deliver solutions. N neither of those, those um, activities requires uh, a lot of knowledge up front. It, it requires a skill set to go figure things out and gather uh, information that you may not have. So I, 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 like Helen said, we ask a lot of questions, try to understand the needs, talk to our team and sometimes outside our team to come up with a solution that we know this is going to meet the client's needs and budget. So it, it, it's, it, you don't need to be intimidated by that. It, it, you, you can do it. Eric, when you say talk to outsiders, you mean other sign world owners and sign world suppliers? Yep, yep, primarily. Okay. Larry sometimes, Foster? Sometimes competitors, even though, believe it or not. Sure, sure. Larry Foster, your thoughts? Well, let me start by telling you I don't have a creative bone in my body. And when I go out and I see customers, I, I, I tell them that I'm not creative but I know how to hire creative people. Right. And so I do exactly what Helen said. I go out, I ask a lot of questions, I take notes and I bring it back. And then once it's back inside my building, that's when the ideas come from. And that's, then we take that back to the customer either through an email, a layout or in person and we give them ideas. Jack, your thoughts. Basically, George, what you're asking the customer is how many do you need, how big do you want them to be, where do you want them to go, how long do I have to work on the project? Let me get back to you with a proposal. You run out of there calling 300 sign world owners, 75 suppliers, corporate staff. When you get back to your office, your sign makers can ask you, why did you talk to him today? I've done that 100 times. You're really there for the tactical, letting the staff take care of the creative side of it. There's enough training and there's ongoing training. We've all had to do the same thing. Okay, I got a box uh, charade with just a little line in it. Um, I don't know who that is. Skip over, come back. Okay. Jason Hedinger. Jason, come off of mute. Go ahead, Jason. I'm Jason Hedinger. I'm uh, in Southern Ohio, a pretty sparse area where I'm at. Uh, Jack asked me to you know, sit on this and uh, listen. I guess the question I have is, you know, I understand that a lot of the sign world businesses have larger accounts, not within their operating area, all over the United States in some, some circumstances. But how do you get started out when you're in a, a, I guess, a rural area with small mom and pop businesses? I mean, and then how long would it take you to, to actually start having enough income to where the business would be self-sustaining. Uh, Jack, Jason, can you give us a feel for how small his area is? Uh, you know, he's, Jason, you're, if I remember right, you're about 30 miles south of Columbus. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, vill the village I'm in right now, to, to, to give you an idea, has a huge whopping population of 575 people. So but if I want fast food, it takes me 30, 30 minutes to get it to go to a city with fifteen to 20,000 people. 30 minutes away. Yeah. Okay, Helen, your thoughts. Where well, are you? You're way yes. in so I'm in Austin. I'm sorry, Ken, were you saying something? Where you live is way out, yes? Yeah, yeah. so my neighbors are uh, cows and horses, literally. <laughs> um, uh, so I live about 45 minutes away from my shop. That's not what most people would choose. Uh, it's what I chose because it meets my, my goals. So my shop is in North Austin and I commute in each day. But I will tell you that you start out, you don't start out with those national accounts no matter where you're located. You, know, you start building your business locally. And then as you know, Jack and others are great at coaching us on and Ken, you know, you're always asking that successful client for, you know, their referral to the next person up the food chain. So if you do a sign for a local subway, go find out where the regional owner of all the local subway franchises are. You know, if you're doing a job for a hotel, how do you get in touch with the chain of hotels in the broader area? So you kind of grow it from where you start. Um, but for me, you know, again, I live out in a very, very rural area. I chose to live here and I commute into, uh, into Northern Austin every day. And, and we've been very successful being able to grow there. Okay. Eric Gutteson, your thoughts on 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I live in a urban, suburban, I guess, uh, area and commute 15 minutes to our, our office each way. So I may not have the best perspective, but it, it my what I feel like I've seen from people who are in, in a more rural or out there setting is, you know, you need to you need to figure out a way to build relationships in the surrounding communities. And once you do that, relationships are huge, uh, huge in terms of success because you're not just a solution provider. You're, you're people people in those types of communities really want somebody they know, trust, and and want to work with. So. Um, that would be, I think, a key to success in that environment. And Larry Foster, don't you live uh, pretty far out in suburbia? I live you know, about 25 miles, or no, about 15 miles north of my business. And, I, and my business is about 40 miles north of Detroit. And your commute? Uh, about 20 minutes. Okay. Jack, your thoughts? You know, we've got people in big markets, small markets, and it's something, Jason, that we'll have to look at more and, and help you figure out. Uh, to my pan or to my, my our guests here, if you can tighten up the, the time it takes for you to ask a question and, and the panel will shorten up. We've gone through six questions. We've got 25 more people to go here. So we want to make sure we get everybody through. Okay. Jason, my thought would be commute 30 minutes. Rob, uh, Lily, Lilic, Rap. I'll take, I'll take that. I'll take that. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a short question. Can you guys uh, talk through your business structure? Whether you guys are a C corp, an LLC, or an S corp, and then any advantages or disadvantages you guys have seen in your time in the business? Thank you. Helen, what are you? So I'm a C corp. That was dictated by my funding model, which was a 401k rollover. You needed to do C corp, and it's worked out fine for me. Eric Gustafson, CPA. What did you choose to go? Ditto to Helen, exactly the same. And uh, Larry Foster, how did you, uh, what, what type of business do you have? C Corp? LLC. LLC. Jack Werner. Uh, I was an S Corp. Uh, I did not have a 401 that I could fund it with. I wish I had, I would have saved capital gains tax. So probably 90% of the people doing Simul, if they have a 401, are using it. But we're still very fundable through the SBA, and we have lots and lots of Simul loans that have a track record with SBA as well. Others have done home finance and whatever, but uh, C Corp is, is defined by the 401. Others are doing S LLC. Todd, come off a of mute, Todd. Tell us your last name, please. McLaughlin. Go ahead. Uh, my, I guess my big question is, is there any value in having people do uh, additional sales for you with pass through of a bit of commission or anything as now, you're starting out? Helen, uh, would you add a salesperson in the beginning or at what point? Uh, no, I, I, uh, I do not have a dedicated sales person. we we all do sales. Um, at this point, uh, I have two people who probably spend most of their time on sales and that's myself and the person who answers the phone. Uh, but everybody in my office is trained to answer the phone and to take information and at least put together a preliminary proposal. So at this point, I do not have a commission based salesperson. Eric Gustafson, your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer a, a sort of sales slash project manager. Somebody can own the customer interaction from first call all the way through project completion and own it, um, which is a role that can be in a commission base or can be just a base salary based. I currently have one that's on a base salary and it's working out awesome. And at what point did you bring that person on? Uh, I brought him on two years ago, then he left. And I, and I cried and then I got him back and I rejoiced. Okay, so you were already in business how many years before you brought him on? Oh, like five. Got it. Uh, Larry Foster, your thoughts on salespeople inside? Um, I don't have any dedicated sales staff. I have uh, myself, I do most of the outside sales, but I also have three people that go out and do them and they enjoy doing them. Uh, but the majority of the front end of my operation, I would call inside sales, emails or phone. Jack? You know, there are very few paid sign salesmen in our industry uh, or trained. So unless you have that person has a sign experience, uh, later on, you can train them. But in, while you're still learning the business, you need to have 
only yourself or a trained si uh, salesperson. Don, are you there, Don? Are you Don Hodges? Come off a of mute. I am Don Hodges. Thank you. Yes, I'm out of Tri Cities, Washington, so Eastern Washington over here. Um, my question, because I am just looking, I'm kind of in the early stages of this. Um, two parter, biggest win from the first year, biggest struggle out of the first year of ownership. Okay, Larry Foster, can you remember that far back? <laughs> I do. Biggest win, biggest struggle. Well, I can tell you the biggest win for me was the knowledge that I gained on the on the size of the job that we were capable of doing. You'll you'll get yourself into a job and it will seem so large and when you break it down and you accomplish that, it is the greatest feeling going. And uh, we had that. Um, I think the biggest challenge when you get started is looking for those customers that have the um, the repeat business that you're looking for. You're mm -hmm. always looking for that, and and so that's the challenge is to find those those people and develop them. Larry, yep. what okay. percent? Of your, Larry, what percent of your business today is repeat? Uh, it's between eighty-five and ninety percent repeat business. Okay. Eric Gutterson, your thoughts on biggest win, biggest struggle in the beginning? Um, so uh, thinking back to my first year, biggest win, I remember we got a $20,000 order to put a bunch of dimensional letters on some existing monument structures in a housing complex. And I was like, wow, we got a $20,000 order right away that, that, that like made that month profitable. And I was so excited. Um, biggest struggle for me early on was the lack of knowledge and the lack of confidence in my own knowledge um, mm -hmm. to make sure that I was I was providing the right solution and quoting the right job, coupled with um, my misunderstanding, uh, or maybe that's the wrong word, but not everything goes right when you're doing a custom job shop. There's, there's occasional rework, there's things like that, and accepting that a small amount of that will always happen yeah. in a little while. Um, you know, you got to minimize it, of course, to be profitable, but accepting that it isn't always perfect uh, was a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. Helen, biggest win, biggest struggle. Um, so I think, you know, biggest win was when we won a job that had quite a bit of, uh, quite a few different types of signage in it. Um, it was also our biggest, our biggest project. It ended up being around $40,000. Um, you know, biggest struggle. <laughs> I, I look at it as, as as a win at the same time, and that is when projects don't go right, right? And in the midst mm -hmm. of it, you just feel this thing in the pit of your stomach. But what we've learned from every single one of those is what we've learned from every single one of those. And right. every single one of those, Tuition. we're able to say, this is what we learned. This is how we're going to be smarter about the next one that we do. This is now how we're going to be smarter about how we talk to our clients. And so every one of those those problems that we hit along the way was just fodder for growing our expertise and growing our business. Mm -hmm. Jack? My biggest win was how quickly I realized that I'd made the best business decision in my life. I couldn't wait to go to work and the days went by so fast and I just had a ball. Uh, biggest struggle was just really figuring out who is the right customer and what are all the different choices for it. But it's a learning curve that goes on. It really is a blessing in the business long term. Makes sense. Bob, come off a of mute, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me on. I don't have any questions. I'm just here to listen, and I appreciate you guys and the time that you're putting in. Thank you, Mark. Ben Lockett. Ben, come off of mute. Go ahead, Ben. Thanks for your time today, guys. Ben Lockett from uh, Denver, Colorado. Quick question. Uh, where would you say is your most successful, or what would you say is your most successful sales channel to drive leads to the top of a funnel, new customers? Okay, Helen, what's your most successful source of leads? Uh, well, it's definitely the internet. And internet. We've got a very active um, uh, digital marketing uh, company that we use for, for Google Ads and for, for building up our search engine optimization. And then I also spend a fair amount of time investing in keeping our, up, our website updated, our Google reviews current. So it's definitely the internet for new customers. Can you tell us what percent of your new business, Helen? Probably about 80%. Oh, of our new business comes from the internet? Yeah, probably about 80%. Eric Gutherson, what percent of your new business comes from the internet? What's your greatest source of leads? 
Yeah, it's it's internet. Um, we don't spend a ton. We've got an internal person that manages our pay per click, and but it's still our primary source of new customers. Um, probably 60, 70 percent of new comes from there. Okay, and Larry Foster, what percent of your new business comes from the internet? It's not just from the internet. It's just what, what, what of all the channels, which is the most successful? I guess it's the internet. But yeah. it would be great to hear from Larry what. What is what? Of all the channels, Larry, what's your most successful? Uh, it, it, all my, my new business, 75% comes from the website. So it's from the website. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mark, come off the of mute. Mark, tell us your last name. Hi, this is Mark Mayer. I'm outside of uh, Huntsville, Alabama area. Um, Ken, thank you for inviting me to this. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend your guys' uh, virtual um, the Discovery. virtual Discovery Day last week, and one of the uh, items that was brought up, and I think Helen, you were on that uh, call, was talking about working with other sign makers within your your territory or within your geographical area, but not of Sign World. And I was wondering if you, if each of y'all could expand on that a little bit. Um, it seemed like to me the competition could also be a very good asset from what I saw on the discovery day. Helen? Yeah, so so leverage the sign world companies around you, that, that probably is obvious. What is less, and definitely encourage that. What's less obvious to people is that get to know your competitors because they're taking a collaborative approach, you're gonna be way, way ahead than viewing, viewing them strictly as competitors. Uh, you can partner both with sign world sign business owners as well as uh, non sign world sign business owners. Uh, people have unique capabilities available to them. They may have excess inventory that you don't have. So definitely be leveraging those other sign businesses around you. Eric Gustafson? Yep, same thing. I mean, it's right in our core values. One of them is partnership. And in our statement, we talk about um, relying on and building relationships with our customers, our suppliers, and in some cases, even our competition. And, and we do that. Um, you know, it's all about meeting the needs of our customer. And when, when that need is best served by one of our competitors um, and the competitor is willing to work with us, we're happy to do that. So you, you just got to do it in a smart way and make sure those people are, are, ethical, decent people, and it'll be good. Larry Foster? Well, we've probably got about 10 sign worlds right in my market, very close. We all work very well together. We work on projects together. Um, I trained most of them when they came into the market, and I help them to this day. And competitors, you do business with competitors? I do. Uh, I've got uh, competitors that I have used to make my channel letters. Um, I, I do a lot of the printing for a couple of different uh, uh, sign companies that are non-sign world that are close to me. Jack Warner? You're going to have equipment they don't have and they're going to have equipment you don't have and it's collaborative. Ken, I'm going to show a couple of slideshows here. This is going to go on while we're having conversation. There's no audio. The first one is just showing you some of the operations inside and out so you can see how diverse they are. The second one is showing you what is assigned, both what's made with the initial equipment and what you can outsource. Uh, the third one is just showing you some of our wall of fame. So we'll continue with questions while these slideshows go through. Okay, once again to the panel, shorter answers, shorter answers. All right, uh, lost my place here for a second. Give me Steve. North, Steve, go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Note. I'm located 30 miles east of Columbus. Um, my question would be, how do you recommend taking your salary at the beginning of your business, or how long would it take for you to uh, start a salary? Helen McKinstry, how long before you could take a paycheck? Uh, it was probably a few months I started taking a paycheck. It started out very, very small. I just kind of based it on how the business was going. Eric, how long before you took a paycheck? I think I took something out in month two of actual functional operation. Okay. And, and you keep it small. How long you took before you took a paycheck? Five months. Jack Werner. I took my first paycheck in month six. Okay. Ramsey Hoffield, come off of mute, Ramsey. Go ahead. 
Yeah, hi, Ramsey Hoffield. I'm in the Southern California market. Just started looking at this recently. Um, I guess I'm curious, unexpected expenses. What was your biggest unexpected expense in year one? Helen? I'm drawing a blank, quite frankly. I mean, it was pretty much in line with the business plan. A little variability, but nothing awfully unexpected. Okay, Eric Gutherson, CPA, biggest unexpected expense? Uh, God, I didn't have one. I mean, I, I think I was surprised at how much sign production materials cost, but you mark them up. So it really wasn't anything truly unexpected. Larry Foster. For me, it was probably rent. Um, we were, it was a different business model back then. We were in more of a retail strip and the rent was high. So it was good to move out. Okay. John, uh, Jack, uh, biggest, uh, I think most sign will donors will tell you that the uh, the performers are are pretty accurate and the uh, working capital uh, budgets are are within reason. So uh, well prepared. John Obenhaus. John, come off a of mute. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, well, th thanks everybody for being so generous with your time. It's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know after you're established. Um, I mean, what keeps you up at night or what, what's your biggest challenge, you know, once you get established? Helen, what keeps you up at night? You know, I'm always wanting to make sure every single job is the kind where the customer can't wait to give us a great review. Uh, so if I'm anticipating any kind of problem at all, I'm trying to get in front of it. Uh, so I, probably the things that keep me up at night are just individual projects I'm wanting to make sure are slam dunks for our client. Eric, what keeps you up at night? Yeah, yeah, just a fear that I missed something like an important customer email or something like that. Um, as my, yeah, I'll just, you want them short, I'll stop there. <laughs> Larry Foster, what keeps you up at night? There's not much that keeps me up at night, but, uh, you know, we have probably 200 jobs going at the same time. So project management is always the biggest concern. Jack Werner, what keeps you up at night? Uh, I slept pretty good. I enjoyed the day and I, Enjoyed my nights. Tom Thompson, come off the mute, Tom. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm uh, from the uh, Seattle area. And uh, my question really is around uh, the amount of training that it takes. I, I'm just trying to get an idea of what's the expectation. Does it take about 80 to 160 hours of training before you actually get to that comfort level to be able to go through and go live on day one? Or is it something less? And about what's the spread of that? Is that a, over a... Uh, a two-month period, a six-week period. How long did it take um, to get that uh, that level of comfort? Jack, uh, you want to start out with that as far as what training is offered? There's five weeks with the training prior to open, which is enough to make you fully functional. There's then live video conference virtually every day for the rest of your life to make you the expert. Uh, you're going to be functional from the beginning, and the beauty of the business is that every product is custom, and so you're learning still. I'm still learning 25 years later. Uh, if it was a business where every day was the same, I'd go bored silly. Okay. Talat, come on. Come off a of mute, Talat. Yeah, hi. Um, no, I, I don't have any questions. I just, uh, because most of my questions have been answered. One small caveat is how long did it take to feel comfortable? I mean, when you, when you started off, that you're, you're comfortable. Helen, how long did it take for you to feel comfortable? I don't know, maybe that's a hard question to answer, two, three, four months. But to be honest, the day I start getting too comfortable says we've stopped learning, says we're stopping, we've stopped pushing ourselves. So I actually get nervous when we're feeling too comfortable. Eric, how long did it take you to get comfortable? I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm never fully comfortable, but you know, I, a couple months and I was functional. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Larry Foster, how long to be functional, how long to be comfortable? Well, you know, I felt confident. When, when I was done with the training, I felt confident. But uh, comfortable, you always have that little bit of anxiety when you're going out to see customers the first few months until you find out how easy it is. Jack Warner? You know, I, I think they've all answered it well. It's, it's a relative thing that grows, but... Uh, 
I was comfortable quite quickly. I had a great support team around me for any questions that I didn't have an answer to. Rich Waldis. Rich, come on from you. Hello, Rich Waldis. Go ahead. I'm here. I'm all, I do these all the time, and I'm really still really slow on the mute button. Uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, or north, uh, northeast Atlanta, Peachtree Corners area. Um, some great questions and answers. I, I, don't, I don't even know where to go, but I guess, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take the non-business one. I want to know, we, we're doing this for not only uh, financial reward and, and um, uh, the reward of being an entrepreneur, but part of this is for flexibility. So I want to know what you guys do uh, in, for fun and what you get to do. How, how often do you get to take some uh, opportunity for some time away from the business? Larry Foster, how often do you play golf during the week? <laughs> uh, I play golf three days a week. <laughs> and uh, trips with your spouse, Larry? Um, I you go to Punta Cana in January, February. I go to Traverse City um, in June. And I take three fishing trips a year. Eric Gutzison, how many years have you been in business, Eric? Seven. Seven years. Tell us about time off, fun, golf, whatever you do. Yeah, I golf. I'm not as regular as Larry, but uh, I definitely uh, get out. I've played eight times this year. I, um, you know, have gone on family vacations. We have a property in northern Minnesota with, with, that we camp on. I'm going there tomorrow. I'm taking an extra long weekend. So, um, yeah, I get out. Helen. We, uh, so I've been in business three years. Um, we, I'm taking more vaca real vacations now than I did before I retired from my corporate job. We have a little house in upstate New York in the Adirondacks. We go up there a couple times a year. Um, uh, you know, I'm taking trips later this year to take both of my colleges, my, both my boys off to college. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm actually able to schedule that time away a whole lot more successfully than I did in my old life. Bernard, come off of mute, Bernard. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jack Werner. Time off. You know, I was on Little League Field at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, four days a week, uh, manage my boys' teams. Uh, a small business will take as much time as you give it, uh, but you got to discipline. So this is a Monday through Friday business. You're closed nights, weekends, and holidays. I took my first week's vacation at six months. There are some sign world owners who will say they have never, never missed a kid's event, no matter what time of the day, what day of the week. Bernard, come off of mute, Bernard. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, a little louder, a little louder. Turn your volume up, get closer to your microphone. Okay. Is it better? Better, much better. Okay. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bernard Berba. Uh, I spoke to you, Ken, the other day, so I'm in San Diego, California. A lot of my questions have been answered, but I, I have a, a couple here. So the first one, if you're not comfortable or have limited experience in doing sales, marketing, business development, how do you overcome that? Or, um, you know, um, is there, are, there, are there trainings available? Um, then I heard uh, about wins and losses, you know, um, are there, do you have a list of the reasons why you lost some of the projects that uh, got into you? And then I, uh, one last question is the equipment. Or I heard that. Bernard, Two just questions. one question, please. Okay, that's it for me. So let's take the sales question. Okay, Larry Foster, Bernard has no sales experience at all. How will he overcome that? Well, I, most of the sign world owners that, that I know didn't have any sales experience. And it really isn't a sales call. It's what worried me so much before I got started. You're really going out to see a customer and you're finding out what they're looking to do. You take pictures, you take measurements, and you come back. But you're, you're not out there just trying to sell. It's, a, it's consultation. Okay, and Chris, or Eric Gutterson. Uh, Bernard's not a salesman. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I just fall back on being honesty and tr honest and uh, real with my customers and, and, and have a conversation and help them solve problems. And, and that's worked for me. <laughs> Helen? Yeah, it's the same. I mean, focus on it being a relationship you're building, a conversation you're having. Don't focus on it being a sales call. You're there to get information. You're there to inquire. You're there to find out what they're interested in, what their questions are. 
And uh, as Jack and Ken will tell you, there is a sale, weekly sales and marketing training available, and you can always tap into that as well. Jack? Sales is convincing somebody to buy something they didn't plan to buy. We're having customers contact us because they have a need. We're consulting with them about their need. 90% of cyber loans have never done any kind of sales before. It's all consultative. Raul, Ra 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 are you there? Come off the mute. Go ahead. Hi, King. Hi. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Raul. Uh, yeah, I just appreciate the invitation, Ken, and um, I'm calling you from Houston, Texas. Uh, we've got a pretty big sign market here. I understand the market's pretty big, and I uh, really just want to know, you know, what are some keys to winning the business in, in such a big market with a lot of competitors? Larry Foster, how many sign companies are there around you? Uh, the last time I checked, there were about 200 plus in a 20 mile radius. And how do you compete in a big uh, fish pond? I, I don't worry about them. I, I hate to say that. I just I can't believe it comes out of my mouth, but I don't worry about them. I worry about my customers. I do my job and I take care of the customer and do everything I can to satisfy them. And I'm, I've got all the business that I want. And every year of the 19 years you've been in business, every year has been better than the last year. It is. It has. Eric Gutzerson, how many competitors, uh, how many other sign companies around you? Tons. I, I don't know the number, but they're everywhere. Um, and like Larry, I don't really worry about them. I worry about our customers and um, making sure that we can, we show well to potential new customers and we continue to grow. So it, yeah. And every year your business has grown more better uh, than the year before. It has. Helen, your thoughts. So yeah, you want to focus on um, being responsive, right? So there, I've got a ton of sign companies around me. I can't even count them all. Um, but the diff, the, the, what differentiates us is we answer the phone. We respond to those emails quickly. We talk to them. So the feedback we hear from our clients is, wow, you, you got back to me. I'm still waiting for three others. They haven't even tried to get back with me. Wow, you presented me with two or three options. Wow, you asked me some insightful questions. And so it's the level of interaction and the responsiveness that are going to make you stand out from all those dozens around you. Okay, Jack. We've been doing this for 32 years, Raul. Every market is going to be crowded, but not saturated. Most sign companies are not responsive. Showing up for the appointment, getting your quote back quickly. There's more than enough business for you. Talk to every sign owner, you do the same thing. Okay, Ray Sutton. Ray, come off a mute. Go ahead, Ray, we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, my question is around capital investment required and the level of business that allows you to achieve. So with the initial capital of investment, how large does that allow you to grow and what kind of capital investment in equipment was needed to grow to the level you're at today and what is that level? Larry Foster, the initial startup uh, equipment package, how long did it last you? Uh, five years. I bought a I bought a printer and had it delivered to my new building when I moved out of my first location after five years. It's nine o'clock. And Larry, you've been in business nineteen years. You can pretty quickly add up all the equipment you uh, bought. So, what do you think it would average a year? Uh, Ten grand a year, fifteen grand a year worth of equipment on average. Um, it's, it's probably just under ten thousand a year. Okay. Eric Gutzerson, uh, seven years, CPA, your uh, equipment. Uh, how long did the original package last year? Uh, five years. I still have some of it, most of it. I replaced my printer after five years. Um, and then I added a, another better la laminator. Um, so we have two laminators now. So yeah, I've met very little additional capital investment since we started. I put zero dollars into the business since we started. So. Okay. And Helen? Well, I have my original equipment. Um, I haven't made any major purchases yet in three years. I'm anticipating maybe getting a CNC router next year when I'm in a bigger space. But 
So part of the question was, you know, before you felt like your current equipment was limiting your business, I, I don't feel my business is limited. Um, I have a bunch of partners I can use to be cutting stuff up on their routers, to be installing some electrical stuff. And so it's not a question of limiting your business. It's a question of when does it financially make sense from a profitability perspective to acquire some of that equipment to bring it in house versus leveraging some of your nearby partners. Uh, Jack, your thoughts. Most sign holders are going to get to a five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand gross uh, and a twenty-five percent net off of that before they're buying more equipment. A lot of run rate right off of the original. Elias, Elias, come off a of mute. Hello, Elias. Good. Elias, are you there? Ben Zequin. Rama. Parachuri, Rama, are you there? Come off a of mute. Stacy Sonora, Stacy, come off a of mute. Can you hear me? Yes, Stacy, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, my question was, I think, probably dovetailing on the previous question. Um, I missed if there was some sort of package, but I guess based on everything I've heard in the revenue conversation space, um, is there like a percentage rough breakdown you can give for how much you um, invest in the business year by year, uh, overhead, salaries, and then like your own salary or take home pay, if you will? Uh, Just yes, like high, high level. Yes, Jack Werner can send you a three year plan. Say that again? Yes, we can send you a three year financial plan that shows your expenses and so forth. Okay, and is it that there's a package given? I heard someone else say that they invested nothing in the business. I'm just not clear on that. I said I've invested nothing additional since the initial investment. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. And the initial investment, Stacy, is 210 all in, 210,000 all in. Okay. Thank you. We have someone, area code 248-951-2193. Are you, uh, would like to ask a question? Tell us your name, please. Tell us your name, please. Hello. Okay, we have another guest, area code 201-360-7555. Would you like to ask a question? All right, Jack, I hit the list, so we'll go to the uh, box, the Q&A box, which one? Q&A box from uh, Mr. Benzaquin. The 155 said it includes a lot of things, specifically what type of equipment. Jack, you want to answer that? Uh, if you just looked at the slideshow I was showing just a minute ago, the in-house work is what the, the initial equipment will, will provide. Anything two-dimensional. Flat graphics, printing them out on the surface. Hard signs, like stop signs, street signs, real estate signs. Jack, Jack is asking, uh, what's the type of equipment? The type that... of equipment. There's a wide format digital printer, a vinyl cutter called a plotter, and a laminator. Those three pieces of equipment do all the two-dimensional graphics. And how much is the sign world fee? Total investment in sign world is 155. 25,000 beyond that for startup expenses that we know you're gonna incur, we'd rather let you control. 30,000 in a checking account to give the business some working capital. Total 210. And yes, Mr. Benzaquin, that uh, you choose the name of your business. You can call this whatever you wanna call it. And yes, we're gonna give you a list of 75 vendors who we have vetted over the years. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat box or the Q&A. We've uh, gone a little over time. Uh, wanna say uh, uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, Jack, do you wanna close it out? I can, thank you all for being here and especially to our panel, thank you for being here. Uh, we'll have another webinar like this. Next one is scheduled for Wednesday, June 10th, same time of day, different panel of owners. Uh, Please go back to either Dan or Ken or myself, who we've been talking to, and continue the validation talk to sign rule owners and let us help you figure out if this makes sense for you or not. Thanks, all of you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye bye.